Have you ever wondered what everyone felt like after the death of Jesus and before he was resurrected? That's what we'll talk about today. When Jesus cried, it is finished, it was not speaking of the plan of redemption. There were still three days and nights to go before he went to the throne. Jesus' death on the cross was only the beginning of the complete work of redemption. Kenneth Copeland. Today we're going to talk about what Saturday meant before Easter Sunday. As I'm recording it today, it is Saturday before Easter Sunday. This podcast will come out after Easter Sunday. But for the past couple of years, for whatever reason, it started striking me about Easter on Saturday. What was everyone thinking? We thought Jesus was coming into Jerusalem for triumph, and it ended in death. People gave up everything, left their families behind, left their jobs behind, went to places in the world to reach out to people, saw miracles, heard stories listened intently to Jesus, and now he's dead. And so it meant a lot to me in thinking about it. Who would I be? Where would I be in that picture? I wouldn't be an apostle, certainly. But what is it that I would be thinking had I would followed who I thought was the Messiah, and now he's gone? So we're going to talk about some of the people and what happened after the death of Jesus before Easter happened. And when I was thinking about this day and thinking about the Saturday, I asked my friend, is there a name for this Saturday? Do we call it something? And she didn't know off the top of her head that it had any name at all. I said, isn't it interesting? All these days have these names and we never hear about the Saturday before the Sunday. And I'm going to call it Wigged Out Saturday. That is a day when every person who saw the death of Jesus, wigged out, got concerned, got scared, was sad. And it was the day before the resurrection that allowed people to have that moment of thought, not knowing what was going to come next. Of course, this day is often called a couple of things, Easter Saturday, Holy Saturday, or Vigil Saturday. There's many vigils now today that are held on Saturday until Easter comes. And it's very easy for us to see Saturday as a vigil day, primarily because now we know how that story ends, that Jesus is resurrected, he comes back, he shows himself to his apostles, to the people. And so we can call it a vigil now. But it doesn't seem like in the Bible, People considered it a vigil. We didn't see the apostles sitting around going, yep, we knew this was going to happen. We knew exactly how this plan goes. Instead, we see a lot of different types of activity. When we have Vigil Saturday, a lot of different churches, Catholic churches, Roman Catholic churches, Eastern Orthodox churches, will have these vigil periods. There will be baptisms. There will be a lot of joy and hymn singing to bring us to the point where we're going to be at Easter time. So what we have seen happen is, you know, Jesus comes in and all the activities of the week, cleaning the temple, questioning of the rabbis, everything that led to his death. When I was in Israel for the two summers, I stayed in a convent where the clothes of Jesus were cast for as games and the crown of thorns was put on his head. Now there's a convent there, which is right next to a church. At the time, I was an atheist. And what struck me about the whole part of being in Jerusalem was how we know where things happen and how intact the old city of Jerusalem is. This is not a fake town. This isn't a town of rubble. This is a real place with real walls, real buildings. And it just struck me as such a weird thing to be sitting in this place where I can see the path of Jesus and not believe in him. I I didn't even think he was a real human being. My dad always thought that Jesus was a guy made up to tell the people to just do whatever the Romans want. Quit 
bickering with us, quit trying to defy the government. Jesus was almost like a Roman plant because he said that his kingdom wasn't of this world. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But if he was a Roman plant, he was the world's worst Roman plant because he would not only bring the end of the Roman Empire, but he would bring a new leader, a new king to all of us. There's many reasons why people, of course, were upset about the death of Jesus. <laughs> when we look at the apostles, they, like I said, they saw his miracles. They saw the amazing things he did. They thought this was our time of triumph. Other people looked at Jesus as a way of throwing over the Roman government, that now we're going to bring back our own leadership into Israel, and God will lead us, the Messiah will lead us, and these Romans will be gone. There were people hoping to get away from the tax collection inside the Roman government. There were people ready to take back the leadership inside of Israel and other places. But none of that happened. And now with the death of Jesus, people were devastated for their own reasons. But let's take a look at some of the apostles. You know, we know that Matthew was probably the person who wrote first. He watched everything carefully. He quoted in detail, and probably because he was a tax collector, he was obviously literate. He was used to keeping accurate records because you have to keep counting records of who owns what taxes and what has been paid. And so because of that, he probably also knew Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. And so he was able to use his skills to document the life of Jesus. Jesus called him out, told him to follow him. But when Jesus came to his tax collector booth, he said, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. He also had some associated wealth. He had a house. He had the ability to host people in his house. And he acknowledged basically where he came from. He didn't try to hide from it. People did not like tax collectors. It was probably the worst occupation in the world because you're almost a collaborator with the Roman government. The Romans were stripping the people empty of everything. And if you couldn't pay, you gave up your animals, which was meant to feed you, and gave up everything that you had. So most of the Jews hated the tax collectors. Like I said, he was not someone anyone was going to like. Yet Jesus called him and saw the worth in him, despite what the other people saw in him. I think the thing that's interesting, and it continues in the New Testament, are all the people that God calls into his mission. Very weak, some of them dangerous, some of them blatant sinners, all of them have problems. Moses didn't want to even speak. There were so many things, but God saw worth in Matthew come in and be one of his apostles. And Mark was very pragmatic, and he was sometimes called John Mark. His Hebrew name was John, and his Latin name was Mark. So that's where we get the two different names. Peter went to the house of Mary, which was John's mother, and called Mark. His mother was also a member of the church. And when Peter was released by an angel from prison, it really impacted him too. There's not much known about how or when he came to faith, but we know that he stood with the apostles all the way to the end, commissioned a church in Antioch, carried the gospel probably to Asia. So Mark's gospel was the shortest. It talks about the birth and death of Jesus. He quotes the Old Testament. He wrote it for an audience so that they could understand the full path of what was going on with Jesus and how we get to Jesus. But he also uses, they say, some Latin words, some expressions, that people who were Romans would have understood too. We go to Peter, the disciple who was first named Simon, but because Jesus called him the rock, that's what Petra, Peter, means, his name was changed. And Peter was in such an interesting guy. And you see him ah, changing so many times. He goes from someone who's so strong and so enthusiastic, and you could tell he really reaches people. But then he's the one who denied Christ. Or sometimes he begets angry or he does rash things like cutting off the ear of the centurion. It's an amazing thing 
that Jesus saw in him, this ability, this capability that Peter had. Peter was not educated or was untrained, and that he probably didn't even know Greek. His heart, his strength in all of this led him all the way to Rome, all the way to his death. But Peter became the trusted leader of the church after Jesus was gone. He was the first one to run to the empty grave. After Mary and the other women told him the stone was rolled away, Peter ran. So he was enthusiastic about him. And of course, we know that Peter, born in Bethsaida, lived in Capernaum, which was part of the Sea of Galilee. And so he was also a fisherman. And we also know about his brother, Andrew, who went and got Peter, Simon at the time, and brought him over to meet Jesus. The interesting thing about Peter is he had a mother-in-law. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. So there must have been a wife or maybe a wife at one time. There was some mention that some of the apostles traveled with their wives. Possibly it was Peter who did travel with his wife. Not really much is known about it. But now think about Peter. Jesus told him he was going to deny him three times. That this final weakness that happened to Peter when he was probably scared that he was going to get scooped up with Jesus, maybe also thrown in prison and killed, panicked him so that he denied Jesus three times. Even after he was told it was going to happen and he denied that it was going to happen, Peter must have felt like a wreck. That at that very last moment, when Jesus needed someone to stand up for him, in his mind, probably, he failed him. And then he probably, you know, like all of us, think about all the times when we feel like we failed somebody. And then we think about all the other times we fail someone. And it destroys us. It brings us down because we needed to be strong at a point and it didn't happen. We had the sons of thunder. Those were the sons of Zebedee, John and James. John was particularly close with Jesus, a big church leader, but he stayed firm. He was also told by Jesus to watch out for Mary, Jesus' mother. So you knew that Jesus trusted John quite a bit. He must have been devastated knowing how close they were, knowing how trusted he was, that Jesus was now gone. And John was the youngest of the apostles and eventually got exiled to the island of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation, among other things. But he was very devoted to Jesus. It must have destroyed him. So he was the last of the apostles to die. We have Judas Iscariot. Nobody knows. I don't know that we'll ever be able to tell exactly why Judas betrayed him. But we knew that he was a thief. It mentions that when the perfume was placed on Jesus' feet and he complained that this could have been sold for a lot of money, it said in the Bible that he didn't care about the poor. It was because he was a thief and he was in charge of the money bag that he used to help himself. So he was stealing money from the apostles. So he was already disreputable. He already wasn't trustworthy. And for money, he sold out Jesus. If you read about it, because I did a lot of reading about Judas, is that some people, again, I mentioned in a past podcast where people thought, well, he thought, Jesus is God. You try to arrest him, even if I betray him and tell you where he's at, you obviously can't do that. He's God. It's nothing's going to happen. Or that maybe he even wanted to bring this to a point. The word Iscariot could mean where he's from or something to do with his family name, but it also has roots in Latin for murderer or assassin. And so that also led some other people who were people who belonged to the Sicarii. They were a radical Jewish group who often did acts of terror against the Romans because the Romans were occupiers and wanted to release Israel from Roman occupation. So if he believed that Jesus was going to bring this Roman Empire to a head and to a point and get them out of Israel, he might have been too anxious to do that. Again, we don't know. But before Jesus was even put to death, 
Judas put himself to death. He did not even survive the aftermath of what he did. Thomas, Didymus, who was sometimes referred to as Doubting Thomas, he always asked the probing questions. You know, he, he wanted to know why it was like this or what makes you think that's going to happen. Or if I believe that your resurrection, even after Easter, he had to put his hands in the holes of Jesus' hands. So is he doubting or is he questioning? But the idea behind Thomas being so questioning and so analytical about things makes you wonder how he would have felt after the death of Jesus. Would he have fallen away because it just didn't make any sense? Would he have interviewed people and asked them good questions about it? You know, we don't know. But you can tell that a brain like his probably was running through the events and the details trying to figure out what actually happened. Mary, mother of Jesus, devastated. I mean, it had to be. And there was even a prophecy that talked about that it would be like a sword through her. And that point came. There's that amazing piece of artwork, I believe that's in Rome, where she's holding the body of her son, which puts the contrast of Mary holding the body of her son when he was a baby. And now she's holding him as a man who had just been killed. But after the death of Jesus, she had to be weeping. And honestly, what mother wouldn't be? It had to be devastating to see anyone's son in this position. But because she came to believe him also to be the Messiah, it had to make everything much more shocking. She got to see her other sons become loyal Christians and leaders in the church. She was mentioned in Acts 1.14 that she was taking part in praying. Her faith also was still with Jesus after Easter. She was at the cross of Jesus. She watched him die. And when Jesus finally died, he said, woman, behold your son. And then he said to John, behold your mother, meaning you are now to take care of her. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw the tomb was empty. She's the one who ran to Peter and told him, they've taken our Lord out of the tomb and I don't know where he is. You know, she didn't know where to find him. She also did not believe the message that Jesus said about the fact he was going to be resurrected. They looked inside and they see that the clothes, the linens were lying there and completely folded up. They didn't understand or they didn't believe or they didn't get when Jesus said that he was going to come back, that they just needed to wait. She wept when she saw the empty tomb. She asked a person that she did not recognize. What have you done with my Lord? And finally, Jesus revealed himself to her. Why are you weeping? So she had that first chance in Easter to see it. But the thing that gets me about Mary Magdalene the most, and I think that people are going to connect themselves to different people. If you're a mother, identifying with Mary, mother of God, is probably very close. But when you're Mary Magdalene, It reminds me that if you've been far away, if you didn't have God, she had a life that didn't look very good before Jesus. She's had demons in her. Jesus personally saved her from her past, from the demons, and she followed the apostles and Jesus around. She was bound to the group and bound to this commitment When she called him Lord, she believed it. When she asked in Aramaic, Rabbani, that meant my teacher. Anytime you see an I at the end, it means mine, my teacher. And what she must have felt as someone who was saved from so many things must have been devastating to see her Lord die, her rabbi die. So I feel, in some sense, a lot of kinship with her. I didn't do some of the things that she had done, and I didn't have demons in me. But because I was saved from my lack of belief in God, I feel a a kinship like that. I hope I would be that person who would stick to the end. I hope that I would believe in the resurrection of Jesus. But to be honest, most people didn't. Joanna was there. She had been healed by evil spirits and diseases by Jesus. And she became another follower of Jesus who walked around with the disciples and traveled town to town after that. 
She was the wife of a manager of Herod Antipas' household. And it said that she was a woman of means and influence. So she also was able to provide supplies and other things to the disciples to give up what she probably had in terms of material possessions and being part of a rich household. I wonder if she questioned if she took the right path. They also said at the resurrection, there were a large number of people who followed him. That was mentioned in Luke. What did they think? I mean, that's most likely our position in this. If we weren't healed by Jesus or called by Jesus, we were probably one of the large number of people. Did they walk away and go home? Did they think, well, that's a bust. I thought this was going to turn out to be the Lord, or I thought he was going to do X, Y, and Z. Well, now that's not going to happen. So I wonder how many people still stood by him and how many people just went home. We see it, you know, even today when someone famous gets a following and then they do something or they die. And those people just disappear, find someone new to follow. What happened to that large group of people? It said that there were also those who knew him, which I assume are apostles, including women, it says. It said that the chief priests also were there. It said in the same way, the chief priest and the teachers of the law and elders mocked him. That's Matthew 27, 41. They were there. They scoffed at the whole thing. Luke 23, 35, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself, if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. So they scoffed at him too. So you can imagine the teachers, the Sanhedrin, maybe even half the soldiers there were gloating about it, sneering about it. They were glad this was over. The Romans were probably glad because this was causing disruptions in the Roman Empire. The one thing that the Romans wanted was everyone to stay calm, follow the rules, and don't cause a kerfuffle. Because they knew, you know, that they can't take out an entire nation again. They have a contingency of soldiers there. And of course, they're well armed. But the last thing they want is trouble. It's the last thing Pontius Pilate wanted was to have trouble, which is in the end probably why he killed Jesus said frequently he didn't see a reason to kill Jesus, but he did it to keep the peace, probably. Everyone there, whether they were apostles, whether they were the women who walked with the apostles, whether they were the people who had been following Jesus, the Sanhedrin and the elders who were mocking Jesus, the Roman soldiers were there. We know some of the Romans became Christians. It must have been that Saturday, the longest day, most of them had. We don't hear about anyone who said, wait, 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 hold on. Let's just give it till tomorrow. I think he's coming back. There's not one report of that. They thought this was over and not a victory, but a loss. So my challenge to you is think of who you would be in this story. Would you be the analytical mind? Would you be the detailed Matthew, who takes down every note and everything that happens and then wonders why he left his job? Figure out for yourself and think about what the death of Jesus would have meant to you if you had been a witness to it. And then remember that the next day was Easter and the resurrection. Every fear, every piece of anxiety, every piece of loss that you have would now be over because you will see Jesus again and the church roar back into strength, becoming the biggest message of hope the world has ever seen. All right, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Please have a very happy Easter. Please remember that Passover is that pointing towards the lamb that saves us from death. And keep in mind that our walk with Jesus after the resurrection keeps going with small steps 